It was midday, and Fasira's yellow sun loomed directly overhead, beaming down across the lush valley and over the jungle camp where Des and his fellow Sith troopers waited. Beneath the shelter of a Sidera tree, Des ran a systems check on his GSI 21D blaster pistol, before sliding it into the holster clipped to his belt and turning his attention to his troops. All around him, the men and women of his unit were following his lead making similar inspections of their own equipment as they waited for his orders. He couldn't help but smile. He trained them well. He had joined the Sith armies as a way to escape his previous life, but it hadn't taken him long to actually grow fond of a soldier's life. There was a camaraderie among the men and women who fought at his side, a bond that quickly extended to Des himself. In the military, he'd found his true place. He belonged here with the troops. His troops. Senior Trooper Adonar noticed his gaze and responded by thumping a closed fist lightly against his chest twice, just over the heart. It was a gesture known only to the members of the unit, a private sign for loyalty and fidelity, a symbol of the bond they all shared. Des returned the gesture. He and Adonar had been in the same unit since day one of their careers. The recruiter had signed them up together and assigned them both to the Gloomwalkers, Lieutenant Ulabor's unit. Having tasted far more than a fair share of victories over the past year, the Gloomwalkers had earned quite a reputation, going from one of the thousand expendable frontline units to elite troops reserved for critical missions. Ulubor had received many accolades for the success of his troops, but everyone in the unit knew who was really in charge when the blaster bolts started flying. That fact had become painfully clear nearly a year before on Kashyyyk, where Des and Adenor had seen their first action. The Brotherhood of Darkness had tried to secure a foothold in the Mid-Rim by invading the system, sending in wave after wave of troops to capture the resource-rich homeworld of the Wookiees. But the planet was a Republic stronghold, and they weren't about to retreat, no matter how badly outnumbered. When the Sith fleet first landed, their enemies simply vanished into the forest. The invasion turned into a war of attrition, a long, drawn-out campaign fought among the branches of the warrior trees high above the planet's surface. Thousands upon thousands of the invaders were wiped out, most dying without even seeing the opponent who had fired the fatal shot. But the Sith Masters just kept sending more troops in. The Gloomwalkers were part of the second wave of reinforcements. During their first battle, they were separated from the main lines, cut off from the rest of the army. Alone and surrounded by enemies, Lieutenant Ulibor panicked. Fortunately, Des was there to step in and save their hides. For starters, he could sense the enemy even when he couldn't see them. Somehow, he just knew where they were. With Des as their guide, the Gloomwalkers were able to avoid the traps and ambushes as they slowly worked their way back to rejoin the main force. It took three days and three nights, countless brief but deadly battles, and a seemingly endless march through enemy territory. But they made it. Through all the fighting, the unit lost only a handful of soldiers, and the troops who made it back knew they owed their lives to Des. The story of the Gloomwalkers became a rallying point for the rest of the Sith army, raising morale that had become dangerously low. In the end, it took almost 2,000 units, but Kashyyyk finally fell. As leader of the heroic Gloomwalkers, Lieutenant Ulibor was given special commendation. He never bothered to mention that Des was really the one responsible. Still, he'd been smart enough to promote Des to sergeant, and he knew enough to stay out of the way when things got hot. Right now, they were the key to capturing the manufacturing world of Fisira. The Gloomwalker's mission was simple. Eliminate the outpost so the rest of the army could launch a surprise attack on the Republic base camp. The timing was critical. The outpost reported each day at dawn, and if the Gloomwalkers struck too soon, the Republic would realize something was wrong when the daily report didn't come in. Yet when they finally received their orders, it was met with horrified gasps and loud whispers of disbelief. They were to hit the outpost in just one hour. Everyone, including Lieutenant Ulibor, inept as he was, knew it was a tactical mistake. By attacking in broad daylight, their chances of success would plunge, and casualties would increase fivefold. But for all it was worth, 
The order had come directly from a Sith Lord, and there was nothing Des could do to shake Ulibor's fear of consequence. So when the lieutenant ordered them to follow the Sith Lord's commands, Des, after just a moment's hesitation, raised his fist and knocked Ulibor cold. Sith Lord or not, the orders were wrong, and he was not willing to risk the lives of his men. They waited for the sun to set, and at the break of nightfall, the Gloomwalkers moved in. They were waiting on a signal now, waiting for him to take the first shot. As soon as he did, they charged the outpost. But those gunships were a problem Des hadn't anticipated. If he fired that first shot without dealing with them first, his soldiers would charge right into a storm of heavy repeating blaster fire. They would be torn apart. He glanced behind him and noticed a scope on one of his junior recruit's rifles. Lucia. She'd only seen minor combat duty before being assigned to the Gloomwalkers, yet Des knew she was one of the best shots in the unit. Even still, she couldn't take out the nine targets required to clear the way all at once. Not that fast. Nobody could. Taking the rifle from Lucia's hands, he brought the weapon up and set his eye to the scope to get a better look at the situation. He scanned the roof quickly from side to side, noting the position of every Republic soldier. The situation was practically hopeless, but Des was out of options and almost out of time. He felt the fear stronger than ever and took a deep breath to focus his mind. Adrenaline began to pump through his veins as he redirected the fear to give him strength and power. He lined up the blaster scope on one of the gunners, and a red veil fell across his vision. So he fired. He acted on instinct, moving too quickly to let his conscious thoughts get in the way. He didn't even see the first soldier drop, the scope was already moving to his next target. The second gunner had just enough time to open his eyes wide in surprise before Des fired and moved on to the third. Moving his crosshair in a tight circle, he set his sights on a soldier crouched down low beside a small canister. The blast from Des's weapon hit him square in the chest, just as the device at the soldier's feet detonated. The view through the scope vanished in a brilliant white flare, temporarily blinding Des. Yet with his vision gone, Des could suddenly see everything clearly. He knew the position of every soldier even as they scrambled for cover. He could track exactly where they were and where they were going. It was as if time had slowed down. Moving with a calm and deadly precision, he trained his rifle on the next target, taking her through the heart. Barely a moment later, he shot the soldier beside her right between his cold blue eyes. Des took one man in the back as he ran for the nearest gunship. Another was halfway up the flatbed's ladders when a bolt sliced through his thigh, knocking him off balance. It had taken fewer than three seconds to wipe out eight of the nine soldiers. He handed the weapon back to Lucia, blinking rapidly at the tears welling up as his eyes tried to soothe their damaged retinas. The effect of the flash canister were only temporary, his vision was already beginning to return and the miraculous second sight he'd experienced was slipping away. Rubbing his eyes, he knew now was not the time to think about what had just happened. He'd killed the gunners, but his troops were still outnumbered. They needed him down there, in the hot zone, not here on the edges of the battle. Behind him, Lucia was still as a rock, her mouth hanging open in amazement at what she'd just witnessed. Three hours later, the outpost was theirs. But when Des and his troops arrived back at base camp, they were greeted by the sight of a dozen enforcers standing with weapons drawn. Two of them stepped forward, snapping stun cuffs on Des's wrists. A few of the Gloomwalkers began to reach slowly for their weapons, but Des shook his head and they froze. This situation could escalate far too easily. It was only then that Des realized that he had underestimated Ulibor's impulsiveness. He had thought the victory would change the lieutenant's mind, allay his fears of the Sith Lord's rage. But no, now the best he could hope for was a court-martial. There, at least he had a chance. As Des was taken away, he couldn't help but see the look in the eyes of Lucia and the other troopers whose lives he'd saved only hours ago. He had the feeling the next time the unit went into combat, Ulibor would suffer an unfortunate and fatal incident.
The realization brought a hint of a smile to his lips. The enforcers led Dust to a nearby Sith camp, and threw him in the brig, though it more resembled a hole in the ground than any type of holding cell. An interminable period of time passed, Dust slipping into and out of consciousness as he tried to gauge his increasingly limited options. After a few days, he was transferred, though Dust never got a clear look at the man who'd ordered his transfer, and nobody had spoken to him as he was herded into the transport ship heading to Korriban. Still, he was out of that stinking pit and free of his cuffs. He chose to take that as a good sign. After arriving on Korriban, Dest was led by a hooded figure into the temple and down a flight of ornately carved stone steps. Several minutes passed before they reached the bottom, only to find a long hallway stretching out before him. At the end of the hallway, he encountered a single room and inside he was confronted by Lord Kopej, Sith Master, and a member of the dreaded Brotherhood of Darkness. For the next hour, Des was questioned, his goals examined, his power tested. In the end, Lord Kopej presented him with a choice. Rejoin the Gloomwalkers as one of the million soldiers in the Sith army, or stay at Korriban, learning the ways of the dark side unleashing the full potential within him. It was only then that Des realized the shocking truth. Everything he'd had, he'd given to his unit. He'd saved their lives too many times to count, yet when the enforcers had come for him, they'd been powerless to stop them. His friends, his unit, could do nothing for him now. He could only rely on himself. Knowing this, Des gratefully accepted the offer, and was reborn as Bane, Bane of the Sith. The Academy on Korriban would become Bane's home in the years following his sudden exit from the Sith military forces. It was where the strongest in the Force were sent, those who had the dark side potential to someday become Sith Masters. Despite being a comparative neophyte to the others in the Academy, many of whom had been trained there their entire lives, Bane found it surprisingly easy to garner the personal attention of the masters. Under their focused tutelage, he'd progressed quickly through the ranks of apprentices. On just a third day at the academy, he'd been practicing the meditation techniques he'd learned the day before, when suddenly, he felt it. It was like the bursting of a dam, a raging river flooding through him, sweeping away all his failings, his weakness, his fear, his self-doubt, in that instant, he'd understood why he was there. At that moment, his transformation from Des to Bane, from mere mortal to one of the Sith, had truly begun. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. At the end of each lightsaber training session, the class would gather in a wide, irregular circle at the top of the temple. Any student could step into the circle and issue a challenge to another. Blade Master Kasim would observe the duels closely, and once it was over, he would analyze the action for the class. Those who won would be praised for their performance, and their status in the informal hierarchy of the academy would rise. Those who lost would be chastised for their failings, and suffer a blow to their prestige. In the past months, Bane had worked hard to learn his style and refine his technique, and today, he felt ready to take another step. Foharg was a McCurth. In many ways, he reminded Bane of the Trandoshans he had fought in his days with the Gloomwalkers. Lizard-like humanoids covered in leathery green scales, four curved horns growing from the top of their heads. Early in Bane's training, he had fought Foharg and lost badly. Now, he was here to rectify that mistake. When Bane issued the challenge, Foharg confidently accepted, and his confidence was not unfounded. Despite Bane's vast improvement, Foharg was still clearly the better combatant, and a few minutes into the fight, this proposition proved true, as he struck Bane in the shoulder with an incapacitating blow. Bane fell, hanging his head, and Foharg voiced his thoughts. 
You train for weeks to challenge me, Fohark said, drawing out his mockery. You failed. Victory is mine again. The masters cuss at you. They give you extra time and attention. More than the others. More than me. Despite this, you are still my inferior. Bane of the Sith. Bane. Something in the way Fohark said it caused Bane to glance up. It was the same way his father used to say the word. Bane of my existence. Bane of our family. With a scream, Bane thrust his good hand palm forward, ripping through Fohark's defenses and catching him in midair. Dark side energy then erupted from his palm, flinging the stunned McCurth back to the edge of the crowd where he landed at Kasim's feet. Bane slowly clenched his fist and rose to his feet. On the ground before him, Fohark was writhing in agony, clutching at his throat and gasping for breath. Unlike the McCurth, Bane had nothing to say. He squeezed his fist harder, feeling the force rushing through him like a divine wind as he crushed the life out of his foe. A final surge of power roared up in the core of Bane's being and exploded out into the world. In response, Fohark's body went stiff, and his eyes rolled back into his head. Bane released his hold on the force and his fallen enemy, and the McCurth's body went limp as the last vestiges of life ebbed away. The victory over Foharg should have awakened the power of the Force within Bane, but strangely it hadn't. Over the past few months, Bane had made little progress in his lightsaber training as well as in his Force capabilities. And Bane knew why. It was fear. Fear of what he was capable of, and guilt. The guilt of knowing that his father's death hadn't been a matter of circumstance. That night, whimpering from the bruises and scratches his own father had inflicted upon him, Bane had whispered, I hope you die. I hope you die. I hope you die. The doctor said it was a heart attack. Now, shunned by the Academy's masters, Bane spent his days in the archives, reading about the histories of the ancient Sith. Beings like Darth Revan, Naga Sadao, Frieden Nod, Mark Aragnos, each exemplars of the dark side. Bane had long since come to terms with the fact that the modern Sith had turned their back on their predecessors, and it was a rare occurrence to see anyone, master or apprentice, within the archives. So it came as a great surprise when he saw Githany one of the Academy's newest apprentices, walking in his direction. She was, in many aspects, a beautiful specimen. But Bane, even in his weakened state, could sense the depth of her power and ambition. He saw the bright fire of the dark side burning within her, and he yearned once more to touch it. Much to Bane's surprise, Githany presented him with an offer. By helping Bane regain his connection with the Force, he would assist her in defeating Sirak, the Academy's top apprentice. Weeks ago, Bane had lost the Zebrak warrior, and badly. That defeat had been the final straw in his fall from the hierarchy. And now, he wanted revenge, craved it. Still, Bane was familiar enough with the nature of the dark side to realize that Githany was trying to manipulate him. Somewhere along the road, she would probably attempt to leave him behind. Bane was determined not to let that happen. Even as he trained with Githany, Bane, in the darkest hours before morning's first light, met Kasim to practice lightsaber drills and techniques. So, while the Blade Master knew he was growing more formidable with the blade, he didn't know he was making similar strides in other areas. And while Githany could see his progress in unleashing his true potential in the Force, she wasn't aware he was also mastering the intricacies of lightsaber combat. As a result, they were both likely to underestimate the full scope of his abilities. In addition, whenever he wasn't training with Kasim or studying with Githany, he read the ancient texts of the archives. He smiled at the irony of this life. He was the outcast, the student's headmaster Cordis had wanted left behind. Yet with Githany, Kasim, 
in his own study of the archives, he was receiving far more education than any other apprentice on Korriban. The truth would be revealed soon enough. When the time was right, Sirak would discover he had underestimated Bane. They all would. Bane was confused. He had read in the ancient texts that the Sith were built upon the doctrine of superiority, a system where the strong ruled and the weak served. Yet in the Brotherhood, all Sith were equal. Even Kasim, who was possibly the greatest lightsaber duelist alive, had rejected the old ways, telling Bane that only through cooperation could the Sith ultimately prevail. He had told Bane that this was the reason the title of Darth was no longer used. It had been more than just a symbol of power. It had been a claim of supremacy, used by those Dark Lords who wished to enforce their will on the other masters. It had been a challenge, a warning to bow down or be destroyed. That was why Lord Khan had ended it. To defeat the Jedi, the Sith needed to focus all their resources on their true enemy, instead of one another. But Bane still wasn't convinced. The more he heard about this Lord Khan, the more he came to despise him. The way he saw it, Khan was acting like one of the Jedi, worrying about the greater good, seeking to bring harmony and cooperation to an order built on dominance and power. In that moment, Bane acquiesced to his master's teachings. But he also understood that the mysteries of the Dark Side's true potential were beyond his reach, and likely beyond the reach of every master at the Academy. To learn what he truly needed to know, he would have to look outward. The night before, Githany had announced her intention to challenge Sirak in the dueling ring. Initially, Bane had been astonished, even worried. But he wasn't stupid. Githany had been trying to goad him into an illegal attack, an ambush perhaps, planted outside the restrictions of the dueling ring. And in the face of her attempt, Bane had suggested a far more interesting alternative. He would challenge Sirak himself. But even as Bane stepped into the ring and challenged Sirak, he couldn't erase the image of Githany's single tear from his mind. But this was not the time for distractions. Shafts of rain fell from the dark morning sky. And from the darkness, Sirak stepped forward. The Zabrak moved with a quiet, yet cautious confidence. While Sirak was arrogant and powerful, he was also no fool. He was smart enough to understand that Bane wouldn't challenge him again unless he thought he could win. Bane knew he could likely beat Sirak now, but he didn't just want to beat him. He wanted to destroy him, just had Sirak had destroyed him in their last meeting. The two circled each other for a while neither wanting to make the first move. But then, Bane leapt forward, opening the melee with a series of complex, aggressive attacks. He moved quickly, but not too quickly. The crowd rippled in astonishment at his obvious and unexpected skill, though Sirak turned aside his assault easily enough. In response to the inevitable counterattack, Bane let himself stagger back into a stumbling retreat. For a brief instant, he saw his opponent overextend, leaving his right arm vulnerable to a strike that would have ended the contest right there and then. Fighting his own finely honed instincts, Bane held back. He'd worked too long and too hard to claim victory with a simple blow to the arm. The battle continued in the familiar rhythm of combat, the ebb and flow of attack and defense. Bane made sure his attacks were effective yet crude, trying to convince his enemy that he was a dangerous but ultimately inferior opponent. With the surge and swell of each exchange, Bane gently prodded with the force, testing and searching for a weakness he could exploit. It took only a few minutes until he saw it. Despite his training, the Zabrak had no experience in long, drawn-out battles. None of his opponents had ever lasted enough to truly push him. Imperceptibly, the strikes of his foe became less crisp, the counters less precise, and the transitions less elegant as Sirak gradually wore down. The fog of exhaustion was slowly clouding his mind, and Bane knew it was only a matter of time until he made a crucial and fatal miscalculation. In the end, his patience was rewarded. Slowly, the Zabrak's desperation turned to hopelessness, 
and every impulse in Bane screamed with the desire to take the initiative and end the fight. Vengeance. The hunger grew with each passing second until it became a physical pain tearing away at his insides. The dark side filled him and he felt it on the verge of ripping him apart, splitting his skin, and gushing out like a fountain of black blood. He waited until the last possible second, before unleashing the energy bottled up inside him in a tremendous rush of power. He channeled it through his muscles and limbs, moving so fast it seemed as if time had stopped for the rest of the world. In the blink of an eye, he knocked the saber from Sirak's hand, sliced down to shatter his forearm, then spun through and brought his saber crashing into his opponent's lower leg. It splintered under the impact, and Sirak screamed as a shard of gleaming white bone sliced through muscle, sinew, and finally skin. For an instant, none of the Watchers were even aware of what had happened. It took their minds a moment to catch up and register the blur of action that had occurred so much quicker than their eyes could see. Sirak lay crumpled on the ground, writhing in agony, and clutching with his one good hand at the chunk of bone protruding from his skin. Bane watched and hesitated a split second before moving in to finish him off, savoring the moment and giving Blade Master Kasim the opportunity to intervene. That's enough, Bane. Bane froze, lowered his saber, and stepped away. It had been interesting to observe the various reactions to his unexpected victory. Githany had been surprisingly angry, unable to understand why he'd left an opponent as dangerous as Sirak alive. Kasim had been rewarding, and a curved tilt lightsaber now hung at Bane's belt. It had belonged to Kasim's master, before the Blade Master had killed him. Yet most vexing of all was Headmaster Cordis. He'd been difficult. Even while congratulating the young apprentice for his victory, he had berated him for his obsession with the ancient arts. But in that battle of wills, Bane had won out, and he left the academy for the Valley of the Dark Lords, where he hoped the wisdom of the old masters would fulfill his need for knowledge. Bane had gone into the depths of the Sith tomb seeking revelation, but he had only found disillusionment. The old masters were gone, their four spirits had abandoned the old planet long ago. Korriban was no longer the cradle of darkness. It was a husk, a withered, desiccated corpse picked clean by scavengers. Cordis had been right, but Bane now understood that he was also very, very wrong. Bane hadn't found what he was looking for, but in the long trek back from the desert, his mind had finally become clear. Hunger, thirst, exhaustion, the physical suffering had cleansed his thoughts. It stripped away all his illusions and exposed the lies of Cordis and the Academy. The ghosts of the Sith were gone from Korriban forever, but it was Lord Khan, not the Jedi, who were to blame. They had twisted and perverted the ancient order of the Sith, the Academy's teachings flew in the face of everything Bane had learned in the Archives. Khan had cast aside the true power of the individual, and replaced it with the false glory of self-sacrifice in the name of a worthy cause. He sought to destroy the Jedi through might of arms rather than cunning. And worst of all, he proclaimed that they were all equal in the Brotherhood of the Sith. But Bane knew equality was a myth. The strong were meant to rule, the weak to serve. For this, Bane knew the Brotherhood of Darkness needed to fall. Bane alone understood this, he alone saw the truth, and he alone could lead the Sith back to the way of the dark side. When Bane returned, Sirak and Githany were waiting in ambush. But Bane easily convinced Githany to turn against her ally, and she and Bane easily slew the once lauded apprentice. This triggered Cordis's wrath, one of the best warriors at the academy, was dead on the eve of their departure to Lord Khan's base camp on Rusan. In front of the entire academy, Bane defied the masters, and left the cursed brotherhood behind, declaring himself Darth Bane, knowing that there was none strong enough to stop him. Bane dropped his ship out of hyperspace on the farthest edge of the remote system. 
and continued slowly towards its only habitable planet, a small world locked in orbit around a pale yellow star. The planet's official name was Lehan, but it was more commonly referred to as the Unknown World. Nearly 3,000 years ago, in this insignificant system located beyond the farthest edges of explored space, Darth Revan and Darth Malak had discovered the Rakata, an ancient species of Force users that had ruled the galaxy long before the birth of the Republic. Yet they had also discovered the Star Forge, an incredible space station and factory, and a monument to the power of the Dark Side. A great battle had been fought here between the Republic, led by the redeemed Jedi Master Revan and Dark Malak's Sith. Malak had fallen, the Sith routed, and the Star Forge had been destroyed, though at a great cost to the Republic. Even now the remnants of that titanic battle remained, but the Galactic Republic had gone to great measures to shield the system from public knowledge, and much of the history of the now extinct Rakatan species was gone, scrubbed from galactic record. As soon as his feet touched the unknown world's surface, he felt it. A deep thrumming, similar to what he'd first felt in Korriban, but much, much stronger. Even the air felt different, heavy with ancient history and secrets long forgotten. Bane had almost given up when he found what he was looking for. A Sith holocron, remarkably smooth and devoid of any etchings or markings, trembling. He set the holocron gently on the floor, then sat before it. He crossed his legs and began the deep, slow breathing of a meditative trance. Gathering and focusing his energy, Bane projected a wave of dark force power out to engulf the small relic on the floor. The holocron began to sparkle and shimmer in response. A small beam of light projected out from the top, the particles scattered and diffused. They began to shift and spin coalescing into a cloaked figure, its features completely hidden by the hood of its heavy robe. Then a voice spoke, crisp and clear. I am Darth Revan, Dark Lord of the Sith. The empty halls of the temple above trembled with the reverberations of Bane's triumphant, booming laughter. Revan had discovered many of the rituals of the ancient Sith, and as his holocron explained its true nature and purpose, Bane could barely wrap his mind around their awesome potential. Revan had been a true Sith Lord, unlike the simpering masters who bowed to Khan and his brotherhood. And soon, all his knowledge would belong to Bane. By its very nature, the dark side invites rivalry and strife. This is the greatest strength of the Sith. It calls the weak from our order. Yet this rivalry can also be our greatest weakness. The strong must be careful, lest they be overwhelmed by the ambitions of those beneath them, working in concert. Any master who instructs more than one apprentice in the ways of the dark side is a fool. In time, the apprentices will unite their strength and overthrow the master. It is inevitable, axiomatic. That is why each master must have only one student. Bane's revelation was that the strength of numbers was a trap, one that had snared all the great Sith Lords of the past. Many had gotten close, but all had ultimately failed to destroy the Jedi. He now understood why. Naga Sadao, Exar Kun, even Darth Revan, all had been Sith of awesome and terrifying power. All had drawn in droves of followers, legions of dark side acolytes that eventually had banded together to overthrow their masters, the strongest among them becoming the next master. Thus the line of the Sith had become a perpetuated cycle of weakness. Bane realized that for the Sith to thrive, two and only two could exist at any one time. A master to hold the power and an apprentice to crave it. The rule of two. Only once the apprentice had surpassed the master would the line continue, leading to the master's death at the hands of his pupil and the search for a new apprentice. 
This would allow the Sith to bide their time as their order became steadily stronger, until one powerful enough to fulfill Bane's dream of destroying the Jedi would come into existence. As Bane now knew, the Sith's greatest weapons were cunning and deception. The Brotherhood had diverged from that path, and thus, they needed to be wiped from the face of the galaxy. Kasim was dead. He had found Bane during the last of the Holocron's lessons, parlaying him to rejoin the Brotherhood and help Khan destroy the Jedi once and for all. But when Bane refused, Kasim, regretful as he was, had attacked. Bane was unashamed to admit that he had almost lost. Kasim was one of the greatest swordmasters of the history of the Sith Order, but his skills with the lightsaber had not saved him when Bane brought down the Rakatan Temple upon him. Now his blade, as well as he, lay buried in meters of stone. Bane then left the planet that had been his home for the past few weeks, and sent a hollow message to Lord Khan. He'd put on a striking act. He'd pleaded, begged, to be readmitted into the Brotherhood. He'd told them he was lost and without direction. And with that message, Bane had sent the schematics behind the ritual of a thought bomb. He knew Khan would read it and reread it, and study it until the steps to the world-killing spell laid ingrained in the Sith Lord's mind. He knew that, eventually, when the Sith were at their lowest point, Khan would turn to it for salvation. That moment would be the Brotherhood's doom. But first, he was on his way to meet Githany on the dark side nexus of Ambria. He hoped she wouldn't disappoint him. Bane felt the poison the moments their lips met, and realized that Githany had been sent by Khan to kill him. Still, he ravished in the pain, used it to fuel his dark powers. He was confident that the dark side could burn away the poison within him. For a moment, he even wondered if Githany could become his apprentice. She'd just proven that she was willing to use cunning and deception, whatever measures necessary, to kill her enemy. But her words proved that she believed too strongly in Khan to ever truly accept his knowledge. They parted ways then, each confident in the success of the encounter. Only hours later did Bane realize that Githany had played into his overconfidence and disguised the toxin of the deadly Sinox with a lesser poison. Although he was ashamed to admit it, he had almost died. And if he had, the rule of two, the greatest revelation of the Sith in millennia, would have died with him. Fortunately, Ambria was not only home to deformed creatures and abominations of the dark side, it was also the refuge of the legendary healer Caleb. But upon finding the healer, Bane had been denied treatment. He had tried everything, from physical threats to mental domination, but even in the face of Bane's awesome power, Caleb's will had held strong. It was then that Bane had sensed the presence of another, Caleb's daughter. And only when Bane moved to kill her, did Caleb finally relent. Fully healed, Bane was now on his way to Rusan. He knew that the following weeks would hold both the destruction and salvation of the Sith. Even while explaining the strategy to their next attack on the now flailing Jedi, Khan had to stop short as a dark shadow fell across his tactical map. Behind him, an enormous mountain of a man stood in the doorway, blocking the light streaming in from outside. He was tall and completely bald, with a heavy brow and hard, unforgiving features. He wore black armor and the robes of a Sith, and a hook-handled lightsaber hung at his side. Though he had never met the man before, Lord Khan had heard enough about him to know exactly who he was. Darth Bane, he exclaimed. He cast a quick glance in Githany's direction, wondering if she had betrayed him. From the expression on her face, it was obvious she was just as surprised as he was to see their visitor alive and well. We... we thought you were dead, he began uncertainly. How did you- I'm tired, Bane interrupted. Do you mind if I sit? Of course, Khan quickly agreed. 
anything for a brother. The big man sneered as he settled into one of the nearby chairs. Thank you, brother. There was something in his tone that put Khan's guard up. What was he doing here? Did he know that Githany had tried to poison him? Did he know that he had sent her? Please continue with your strategy, Bane urged with a casual wave of his hand. Khan's hackles rose. It was as if he was being given permission to continue, as if Bane was the one in charge. Gritting his teeth, he looked down at the map again and resumed where he left off. As I was saying, the Jedi are hiding in the forests. We can flush them out if we split our numbers. If we deploy our flyers, we can flank their southern line- Bah! Bane spat out, slapping his open palm down hard on the table. Deploying flyers and flanking armies, he mocked, rising to his feet and thrusting an accusing finger at Khan. You're thinking like a dirt general, not a Sith Lord. A heavy silence had fallen across the room. Even Khan was speechless. He could feel all eyes on him, watching intently to see what would happen next. Bane stepped in close, his face just centimeters from Khan's own. How did you ever find the guts to poison me? He asked in a low, menacing whisper. I... Th th that wasn't me, Khan stammered as Bane turned his back on him. Don't apologize for using cunning and trickery, the big man admonished, moving over to the strategy table. I admire you for it. We are Sith, the servants of the dark side. Now look at this map and think like a Sith. Don't just fight in the forest, destroy the forest. It was glorious. The power of the entire Sith Order focused on one single being. This was how it was supposed to be. The storm rolled down from the plateau and rumbled across the forest. Hundreds of forks of searing lightning shot down from the sky and the forest erupted. Trees burst into flames, the blaze racing from the branches and spreading out in all directions. The underbrush smoldered smoked and ignited, and a wall of fire swept across the planet's surface. The Inferno consumed everything in its path. Yet as quickly as it had risen, the feeling of invincibility faded. For several seconds, Bane was completely disoriented, unable to figure out what had happened. Then he understood. Khan had broken the connection and somehow he had managed to drag the others out with him. Bane stood motionless as the Sith slowly regained their wits and took to the sky in chase of the vulnerable Jedi. He saw Githany, and as he watched her run to join the others, he realized that she had been corrupted by the teachings of Cordis and the Academy of Korriban. Despite her promises to follow him, she couldn't see beyond the Brotherhood and its limitations. She was tainted, unfit to be his apprentice so she would have to die with all the others. He watched her soar off, then he climbed into his own flyer. But instead of following Khan to the battle, he set a course back to the Sith camp. It was almost time. The camp was completely deserted. But Bane could feel the presence of another close behind as he landed his flyer near the main tent. Bane let his hand drop to his lightsaber, ready to unclip it at a moment's notice. But the other flyer didn't attack. Instead, it swooped around the camp once, banked sharply, and came down for a landing beside his own. As the rider dismounted, Bane recognized him as Lord Cordis, the founder of the Academy of Korriban. What happened next shocked Bane. Cordis knelt before him, offering his allegiance to the young Darth. Bane was surprised. Was it possible that Cordis had finally seen the truth? The Sith Lord's next words dispelled any such notion. You can kill Lord Khan and become the leader of the Brotherhood of Darkness. He too could only see so far as the Brotherhood allowed. He too would have to be purged. Lashing out with the Force, Bane seized Cordis in a crushing grip before strangling the breath from his lungs. Cordis tried to let out a scream, but with no air in his lungs, it came out only as a rattling gasp that was lost beneath the snapping and crackling of his bones. With a thud, 
he dropped to the ground. The headmaster of the Academy of Korriban, one of Lord Khan's most senior Sith Masters, was dead. Without even a second look, Bane stepped past him and into the tent. The Sith had held a blockade around the planet for the past several months, preventing any Jedi reinforcements from reaching the ground. Now, it was time to change that. He ordered the Admiral to engage the Republic fleet, and although the order made no sense, Bane was a Sith Lord, so the Admiral obeyed. Khan could not believe his eyes, as a battle that had started out overwhelmingly in his favor began wriggling out of his grasp. A series of blasts from a suddenly descending Jedi gunship destroyed three more of his small flyers, and Khan realized that his army was now suddenly outmatched. Swearing vile oaths against both the Jedi and his own people, Lord Khan joined the retreat. He knew Bane was responsible. From the moment the young Darth had landed, he had been nothing but a nuisance, a distraction from his power. Now it was time to put him in his place. When Bane talked to Khan, he felt his efforts to dominate his mind, but they had no more actual effect than a rusted knife scraping against the height plates of a Hulurian ice bore. Yet he had seized on the opportunity and delivered a performance worthy of the greatest dramatist of Alderaan. Due to Bane's machinations, Khan was convinced the Thought Bomb was the key to victory, and he was about to ensnare the rest of the Brotherhood in his web of madness. The second phase of Bane's plan had now been set in motion. By nightfall the next day, it would all be over. Lord Khan had promised them victory, as he had done so many times before, and, as they had always done in the past, the Brotherhood had followed him once again, followed him here to this cave, though Githany wasn't sure if it was more accurate to say they had been led or lured. She had followed him along with everyone else, compelled by the passion of his words and the sheer magnitude of his personality and presence. But now, as the adrenaline faded away, she could finally see the truth. Bane had been right. Khan was a madman, and she needed to leave. But caught up in the masses of fanatically loyal followers, she struggled to move past them. Beside her, Khan started to chant. Githany was not the only one who had sensed something wrong with Lord Khan. In the beginning, Lord Kopej had also shared in the zeal of the Thought Bomb's power. But now that he was away from Lord Khan's battle meditation and thinking rationally again, he realized the plan was utter insanity. Immediately, Kopej started moving carefully towards the cavern's main exit. Escape was impossible, of course. The complex was sure to be surrounded by hundreds of Jedi, but in the end, he wanted to make sure it didn't matter to him. He joined the defenders on the surface in one last stand against the Jedi. His death, the fall of Lord Kopej, Sith Master, would be of his own accord. Miles away, Bane felt a tremor pass through the Force as the bomb detonated. Kopej had, in his last moments, warned the Jedi of the Sith's mad plan and in an attempt to minimize the ritual's damage, Lord Hoth and a hundred other Jedi had entered the tunnels to pacify the Sith Lord. They too were dead, along with Githany, Khan, all of them. The Brotherhood of Darkness had been purged. As far as the Jedi knew, the Sith were now extinct. Bane intended to keep it that way. Bane was the only Dark Lord of the Sith, the last of his kind. The burden of rebuilding the Order would fall to him, but this time he would do it right. Instead of many, there would be only two, one master and one apprentice, one to embody the power and one to crave it. To survive, the Sith had to vanish, becoming creatures of myth, legend, and nightmares. Hidden from the eyes of the Jedi, they could seek out the lost secrets of the Dark Side until its full power was theirs to command. Only then, once victory over their enemies was certain, would they tear aside the Veil of Shadows and reveal themselves. The path ahead would be long and difficult. It might take years or decades before they could strike at the light once more, perhaps even centuries. But Bane was patient. He understood what was to come and what must be done. 
Though he himself might not live to see the triumph of the dark side, those who followed him would carry on his legacy. Someday in the distant future, the Republic would fall and the Jedi would perish, and the entire galaxy would bow down to a dark lord of the Sith. It was inevitable. It was the way of the dark side. Satisfied that his work on Rusan was done, he began the long hike to where he'd hidden his ship. He knew the remaining Jedi would come looking for survivors, but by the time they arrived, he would be long gone. Still, there was one thing that troubled him. In order for all this to come to pass, he had to find a suitable apprentice, one strong in the Force, but not yet tainted by the teachings of the Jedi, somewhere. He needed to find a child worthy of becoming heir to all the power of the dark side. Bane had found Xana huddled beside a dead bouncer, one of Rusan's few native species. Strewn around her were the bodies of two Jedi, each with their necks twisted in unnatural positions. Even then, he had felt the power of the dark side flowing through her. Although it was raw and unrestrained, it was full of potential. Potential enough, Bane knew, to someday even surpass him. That day had been nearly ten years ago, and Bane realized now that his faith had not been misplaced. Despite her young age, Xana was cunning, deceptive, and secretive, yet knew how to use her physical powers to afford her the best advantage. Furthermore, she possessed the rare talent of Sith sorcery, and Bane had been all too eager to indulge her growing curiosities in the matter. To complete her current task, she would likely require all these skills and more. The past few months had convinced Bane that the orbalisks that plagued his body were causing more harm than good. They often drove him into uncontrollable fits of dark side rage, and aged his body multitudes faster than was the norm. Once, he had even almost killed Xana. In the hopes of ridding his body of these parasitic insects, Bane had sent Xana to the Jedi Temple itself to gather any information she could. In the meantime, Bane himself had ventured to the deep core world of Tython, the home of the ancient Jedi Order, in search of the holocron of the Sith Lord Belia Darzu. Within it, he hoped to discover the secrets of constructing such a device of his own. No matter how strong he was in the dark side, his body was mortal, and he needed to find a way to leave behind all the knowledge he had accrued over decades of research and planning. Xana's task was scheduled to take weeks, and he had specifically commanded her not to come to Tython. So it was an unexpected and rather unwanted surprise when Bane saw the form of a ship appear on the horizon. When Xana's spacecraft came in to land 50 meters from where his own ship had touched down, Bane stood impassively, waiting for Xana to emerge. When she did, he saw that there was a young man with her. The Dark Lord could feel the force in him, though its presence was weak. But when he saw the man was missing his right hand, everything fell into place. This was her brother. The boy that had tried to stop Xana from leaving Rusan with Bane, even then he was only one-handed. But that wasn't the point. There wasn't any lost love between Xana and her brother, and Bane knew his apprentice wasn't sentimental enough to have brought her brother along for no reason. He quickly learned that the young boy was now a healer, and that Xana had the cure he needed. Yet the sight of another ship appearing over his apprentice's shoulder, still too far in the distance to make out a model or affiliation, put an end to his thoughts. And an instant later, he felt the unmistakable light side power of those on board. Finally, after decades of searching, the Jedi had found him. The last remaining Sith Lord in the galaxy. Jedi Master Rasta Lasu was the Jedi Order's greatest swordsman. During her battles with the Brotherhood, even the best of the Sith struggled to match her in combat. Master Valentine Farfalla had been Hoth's right man, and a fearsome combatant. To take his flamboyant exterior for granted was to invite death. The Jedi Knight Saro Zaj stood over 2 meters tall and was 150 kilos of raw muscle. Yet, despite his mass, he was still quick enough to snatch a zest fly out of the air. Master Warrer had been instrumental in many of the Republic's victories against the Sith. His unique gift of battle meditation provided others in the army with unbreakable will and unwearable strength. 
The Jedi Knight Johun Athon was the group's only weakling. Once an apprentice of Lord Hoth himself, he had largely been a diplomat to the Supreme Chancellor before only incidentally discovering the Sith's presence on Tython. That left four extremely proficient duelists, effectively the best the Order had to offer, against a Sith Lord and his apprentice. But it was only minutes before the first three were dead, the fourth lie dying, and Darth Bane, Dark Lord of the Sith, moved to kill the fifth. Yet even as the Dark Lord drew in torrents of Force Lightning and envisioned the Young Knight's death within his mind, the fatally wounded war threw a protective bubble around Bane's body. The lightning, instead of arcing across and into Athone's unprotected form, deflected back into the Sith Lord's body, killing the Orbalisks and cooking him within his own armor. In response, the armored parasites released a deadly toxin into Bane, threatening to kill him. Ending Athone's life with a quick slash of her lightsaber, Xana decided to take Bane to Ambria and to the residence of Caleb. Bane wanted to shout, to scream, to bellow in anger at his own helplessness. The cure had worked. But though his mind was whole, his broken body would force him to watch as his apprentice tore the Sith Order apart. Caleb had healed Bane, yet had also alerted the Jedi of his presence. Now, everything he had built, his revelation of the Rule of Two, was going to die with him. As he began to drift off, he asked then for Xana to end his life. She had denied him even that small relief. The next time Bane regained consciousness, it was in his ship. He could feel no other presence than Xana, who sat beside him in quiet meditation. Where was he? What was he doing here? Then he remembered. Eyes flying open, Bane seized his apprentice's wrist, fixing her with a look of pure hatred as he asked her about the Jedi about Caleb, about the future of their order. Yet as he listened, his anger faded and formed into deep pride. Xana had killed Caleb and twisted her brother's mind as so to trick the Jedi into thinking he was the Sith Lord. When he prompted her about his earlier request, she responded perfectly. You still have much to teach me. I will continue to study at your feet, Master. I will learn from your wisdom. I will discover your secrets unlocking them one by one until everything you know, all your knowledge and all your power, is mine. And once you are no longer of use to me, I will destroy you." Upon hearing this, Bane knew, once again, that he had chosen his apprentice well. Ten standard years had passed since Darth Bane, the reigning Dark Lord of the Sith, had lost his Orbalisk armor. Ten years since his body had been burned beyond recognition by his own devastating power. Ten years since the healer Caleb had brought him back from the brink of death, and Xana had tricked the Jedi to believe the Sith were extinct. Bane was in his mid-forties now, and the first faint scars of time and age had already begun to leave their marks on his body. The aging process was subtle but inescapable. Bane accepted this, but it also revealed a fatal flaw of the Rule of Two. He had thought his rule ensured the power of both Master and Apprentice would grow from generation to generation, but as he peered into the holocron, his holocron, resting on the pedestal before him, he wondered if Xana would ever prove herself worthy of its possession. He had chosen Xana knowing that she had the potential to one day surpass even his own abilities, on that day, she would usurp him as Dark Lord of the Sith and choose an apprentice of her own. Bane would die, but the Sith would live on stronger than before. Or so he had once believed. Now there was doubt in his mind. Two decades had passed since the time he plucked the ten-year-old girl from the battlefields of Rusan, yet Xana still seemed content merely to serve. She had embraced his lessons and had shown an incredible affinity for the Force. Over the years, Bane had tracked her progress carefully, and he could no longer say with certainty which one of them would survive a confrontation between them. But her reluctance to challenge him had left her master wondering if Xana lacked the fierce ambition necessary to become Dark Lord of the Sith. Of the many possibilities, 
Bane found one the most troubling. Perhaps Xana had noticed his deteriorating physical abilities and had simply decided to wait. In five, maybe ten years, his body would be a ruined husk, and she could dispatch him with virtually no risk. In most circumstances, Bane would have admired the strategy. But in this case, it flew in the face of the most fundamental tenet of the Rule of Two. In that case, he needed a contingency, something that would extend his life, or restore his body. Or, Bane wondered, replace it with another. The steps to the Jedi Temple were long and arduous, and were possessed of a spiritual nature unlike Sarah had ever seen or felt before. She had traveled to the temple as a representative of the Kingdom of Doan. As the Princess of Doan, and widow to the recently passed Prince Garen, Sarah technically possessed the authority to negotiate on behalf of the royal family. However, this was a different case. A Jedi Knight had been killed on Doan, and seeing as Sarah's own bodyguard Lucia was partly responsible, she had been forced to undertake the mission. Even still, she didn't blame Lucia. Her loyal bodyguard had only been trying to help assuage the terrible grief Sarah still felt at her husband's death. The target had died, but unfortunately, so had the Jedi. Master Abba, of the Council of First Knowledge, led her around the temple, showing her various artifacts and monuments to past glories as well as sorrows that would rather be forgotten. But one monument caught Sarah's eye. Five Jedi names were listed on a large, ornately carved stone plaque, along with a sixth. Unbegotten, tears fell from Sarah's eyes, even as her mind processed the names. Valentine Farfalla, Rasta Lassu, Saro Zaj, War, Johunathon, and Caleb, her father. Sarah still remembered her father's bravery, how he had stood his ground before hundreds of dying threats from Jedi and Sith alike. But she also remembered the one man who had broken her father's iron will. The tall, dark-clad Sith Lord who had used her father's love for her as leverage. Deep inside her, she knew it was his doing. She knew her father was dead at his hand. Sarah had been a victim her whole life. This time, she intended to act. The ritual of essence transfer allowed the user to move his spirit into the body of another, providing his will was stronger than the victim's. And now, Bane knew where to find it. To buy the time necessary for a trip to and from the ancient Sith fortress of Prakith, Bane had sent Xana half across the galaxy to Doan, where she had been tasked with discovering the identity of the planet's mysterious Jedi-killing assassin. The diversion was a success, but Bane had also forgotten to consider a single, wildly unlikely circumstance, that despite his escape from Jedi suspicion, he had other enemies in the galaxy that knew he was alive. Upon his return to see Utrecht IV, Bane was surprised to find Xana's ship still gone, but he was grateful that she wouldn't be waiting for him back at the mansion. He was in no shape to do battle with her now, he was even too tired to come up with a lie suitable enough to explain his absence without raising her suspicions. Yet as his airspeeder approached his mansion on the horizon, he felt a powerful yet strangely muted dark side presence come within his mind's periphery. He opened the door to the mansion and stepped inside, letting it swing shut behind him. He froze as he felt the intruders, twenty odd men hiding around corners, on the stairs, behind furniture, everywhere. Less than tenth of a second later, sonic detonators on either side of him went off, causing him to stumble into the room and right into the trap the intruders had set for him. They poured out like a swarm of insects, sending barrage after barrage of bolts raining down from either side of the balcony. Yet even as Bane threw up a protective barrier, he felt something fighting him, some power blocking his ability to call upon the force. It wasn't powerful enough to stop him entirely, but it was enough of a hindrance that a bolt snuck through his normally impenetrable barrier, striking him in the chest and bringing him down in a flash of pain. 
he wasn't down for long. Jumping back up, he threw lightning towards areas where he'd seen the bolts come from. He was rewarded by the screams of several of the intruders as they fell, cradling their injuries. Even as he moved in for the kill, a pair of soldiers emerged from a hallway to the left, and three more appeared from the hall on the right. They opened fire with tango guns, sending out long streams of sticky synthetic webbing. Driven upward by the attack, Bane grabbed one of the chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. Swinging forward, he landed next to the stairs leading down back to the foyer. To his right, a female Iktachi stood at the far end of the hall, a long, thin knife held in each hand. She grinned at Bane, and in that moment, he knew who was interfering with his ability to use the Force. It was only then that he saw the flash grenades lying at the dead bodies by his feet. They exploded with a burst of intense light and chemical smoke that blinded Bane, and an instant later, he felt the sole of the Itachi's boots strike him hard in the chest. A moment later, he was enveloped by the webbing from the tangle guns, pinning him to the ground. Even blind and immobilized, Darth Bane's fury saved him. Years of training allowed him to focus all his pain and rage in one single instant, drawing on it so he could unleash the full power of the dark side. Once again, he felt the Iktachi's barrier opposing his efforts, but this time he tore through it like it wasn't even there. It was as if the world around him was frozen in place. Though his eyes were still suffering from the effects of the flash grenade, the force rushing through his body gave him an otherworldly awareness of his surroundings. The scene was burned into his brain in exquisite detail, unleashing a wave of crackling electricity that burned away the webbing of the tangle guns. Bane struggled to avoid the Iktachi even as she leapt for him. He managed to roll aside, escaping with only a long, deep cut along one of his forearms. The Iktachi was good, and he knew killing her was the key to victory. Calling upon the Force, he brought his lightsaber to his hand and lunged for the Iktachi. The soldiers fired from all sides, but now with the Force to guide his every move, they were no more than annoyances. But the Iktachi was quicker than Bane expected and she was able to evade his strikes even as he struggled to disarm her. Jumping down from the balcony, Bane landed on the floor in a crouch, absorbing the impact. Then, in one blazing moment, everything went black. The last thing he felt was the slow burn on the underside of his forearm, where the assassin's knife had been. And Bane knew he had been outplayed. Xana knew something was wrong the moment she landed on Siutric 4. The planet's deck officer had told her Bane had recently returned from a trip to Praketh, but that didn't make any sense. There was nothing but danger and potential death waiting on the unstable hyperlane routes to the Deep Core worlds. Would Bane risk his life for nothing? No, that wasn't the master she knew. Likewise, the mansion was in a deplorable state, the windows were cracked, the front door broken, and the chandelier light shattered in the middle of the entrance room. It was obvious that something had occurred here, but what? There were still too many unknowns for her to make a plausible guess. As she explored the ruins, she found a small blue button. Wedged into the wreckage of what used to be a large couch, inscribed with the golden insignia of the Doan royal family. In a flash of comprehension, Xana understood. Her trip to Doan had been little more than a diversion, something to distract her as Bane traveled to the Deep Core and to the fortress of Darth and Dedu, an ancient Sith Lord who thousands of years prior had discovered the secret to immortality. Xana felt betrayed, betrayed and angry. Bane, knowing the end of his physical form was near, was searching for a way to extend his life forever. It was the only plausible explanation, yet it was also a perversion of the Rule of Two, a contradiction of everything Bane had taught her. The day he had found her on the ruins of Rusan, Bane had promised her the mantle of the Sith, told her that one day she would become the Dark Lord and thus carry on his legacy. And now Bane's actions proved that he was no longer worthy of its mantle. Getting back into the ship, she plotted a course to Doan. Be ready, Master. Only one of us will make it off this planet alive.
When Bane awoke, three people stood before him. Despite the combination of dangerous and possibly lethal drugs raging through his veins, Bane was able to focus enough to recognize the assassin who had captured him. The second figure was far more interesting, and the cruel glint in her eyes were unbecoming of her otherwise soft features. Her presence drove Bane into an involuntary flashback, and even as the memories of his past flowed through his befuddled mind, he was able to focus on a single one. Through his thoughts, he saw Caleb's hut. The way he had driven his hand into boiling water even without changing expression. His steadfast will and ungrudging denial. And among those, his single weakness. The child. The little girl who had been the Achilles heel to Caleb's iron mind. It was she that now stood before him. Bane tensed as the girl, no longer truly a girl, drove a hypodermic needle into his veins. Spasms of pain racked his body as he lost control of his major motor functions, and his brain went into overload. She waited that way for several minutes, watching his body conform and twist in agony, before pulling out another needle, colored differently, and stabbing it into him. Slowly, the intense pain that had rendered his mind and body immobile subsided, replaced instead by a dull ache that pulsed and permeated into his every bone. Do you know who I am? She demanded. His answer came slowly. The stimulant she had given him only countered the physical effect of the Senflax. The toxin still clouded his mind, dulling his focus and concentration. An enemy from my past. Is this revenge for him? Bane asked after a long moment. Or what I did to you? Both, she replied, picking up a needle marked with a black sticker. Again, she injected it into his neck. This time, though, the effects were markedly different. Bane's eyes rolled back into his head, and his teeth slammed shut, narrowly missing his tongue. Then again, his body began to convulse, causing his chains to rattle madly. The third being turned away possibly in disgust, unable to watch, while the Iktachi assassin leaned in closer, enthralled by his chemical-induced torment. Sarah let the seizure continue for a full ten seconds before injecting him again with one of the yellow needles to counter the effects. Do you see the kind of punishment I can inflict on you? Sarah asked. Now do you understand what it's like to be at the helpless mercy of another? He didn't answer right away. His breathing was ragged, his face and bare scalp covered in sweat from the pain he had endured. You have no lessons to teach me, he gasped. I understand suffering in ways you will never comprehend. Caleb did not die by my hand. She stabbed another needle into his neck, inducing another seizure. She expected him to pass out from the pain, but somehow he managed to stay conscious. I did not kill your father, he insisted. Though his voice was so weak, she could barely hear him. Sarah responded angrily, You may have not done the deed, but you are the reason my father is dead. Do you deny that? Caleb was weak. When he ceased to be of use, he was destroyed. That is the way of the dark side. I used my power to destroy him, as you are using yours to destroy me. Had I been stronger, I would not have been captured. If I am not strong enough to escape, I will continue to suffer until I die. Bane recognized that for now, Sarah held the power to afflict harm, and in turn make him suffer. But even as he spoke these words, he promised that when he was free, as he knew he would be, she would pay for her actions. Sarah slammed a black needle into him then, yet as his consciousness sank into darkness, it was filled with hate and the glorious power of the dark side. It had been more than 20 years, but Lucia had recognized him instantly. It was Des, her commanding officer, her leader, her hero. Without him, none of the Gloomwalkers would have survived the war. He had saved their lives on Kashyyyk. He had saved them again on Trendosha, on Bis, and on Fasira. Time after time again, he had led them through impossible situations against overwhelming odds, 
right up until their mission together on Fasira, and then Lieutenant Ulibor had ordered the enforcers to arrest him. Lucia had never heard from Des again. Like the rest of the unit, she assumed he had been executed for disobeying orders and striking a superior officer. And even though she believed him to be dead, she had vowed she would never forget the man who had once meant everything to her. So as Lucia watched the princess administer the drugs, pumping them directly into Dessa's system through the thick artery in his neck, she was confused. If Dess had really been the one to kill Caleb, then he had brought this on himself. But when questioned, he had insisted he wasn't the one who killed the healer, and Lucia was convinced he was telling the truth. But despite his words, the princess had refused to listen to facts or reason, her hatred blinded her to everything else. She had stormed off in anger, but Lucia knew it was only a matter of time until her old friend returned to subject us to another round of torture. She had seen the madness in Sarah's eyes. The princess hungered for revenge. Lucia was familiar with that look. She had seen it in the eyes of her fellow soldiers when the enforcers had dragged Des away in cuffs. Yet during the interrogation, she had also listened with growing horror to the words coming from Tessa's mouth. It was clear he had embraced the teachings of the dark side in ways she could have never imagined. He was not the man she remembered. The camaraderie of the Gloomwalkers meant nothing to the creature he had become. But it still meant something to her. Lucia still believed in the ideals of the Gloomwalkers. For years, they had counted on one another to survive. There was honor in their code of unity symbolized in the greeting reserved only for other members of the unit. A closed fist, wrapped firmly on the breastbone, just above the heart. Whatever Des was now, she still owed him her life. He had saved her, the entire unit, too many times to count. Yet when the enforcers had taken him away, she had been powerless to help him. Now, destiny was giving her another chance. Lucia glanced over her shoulder to make sure nobody in the guard room was watching. She picked up one of the red hypodermics, which seemed to be some kind of stimulant or antidote, something to offset the drugs that kept Des helpless and unresponsive. Gently, she pushed the tip of the needle into his thigh. Then, placing the needle back into the cart, she turned and quickly left the room. When Bane awoke, his first thoughts were of the strange, armor-clad woman whose actions had broken him from his drug-induced stupor. He couldn't remember exactly who she was, but that didn't matter now. Now he was free, and he hungered for revenge. Stretching out with the force, he concentrated on picking out the unmistakable presence of Caleb's daughter. His awareness had spread through the halls of the dungeon, whispering over the minds of all who walked them. He had found Sarah along with several other powerful individuals. Yet there was one in particular that drew his attention. Xana. She was here to kill him. Her presence sent a fresh ripple of concern through the Dark Lord's mind. He didn't want to face Xana now, not while he was recovering from the toxins Sarah had used to render him helpless, and certainly not without his lightsaber. Bane had made it out of his chamber and into an empty hallway when he heard someone call his name. He stopped short, and she called to him again, but not as Bane, the name he had taken to be reborn into a life of strength and dominance, but as Des, the name of his former life, where he'd been weak and dependent on the compassion of others. He turned, and this time he recognized the being who stood before him as Lucia, one of the junior snipers that had served with him on the Gloomwalkers. He admired her courage and was grateful for her help, but he wasn't about to let a sense of nostalgia stop him from completing his mission and getting off the planet. Two times, he told her to step aside, but torn between her loyalty to Des and her duty to the Princess of Doan, Lucia remained motionless. Bane began to gather the dark side, the power slowly building. But before he could unleash it, he was hit by a wall of thunderous force rolling out from the corridor to the left. Instinctively, he threw up a defensive shield, absorbing the blow. Yet he was still slammed against the opposite wall, and it knocked the breath from his lungs. Lucia was not so fortunate, and as her body ricocheted off the stone walls and floor of the prison, 
it was reduced to a bloody, misshapen mess. Darth Xana emerged from the tunnel, and picking himself up, Bane readied himself to face his apprentice. You couldn't bring yourself to kill her, Xana said, her voice filled with contempt. You've become weak. No wonder you tried to violate the rule of two. She was standing with her double-bladed lightsaber drawn, the hilt grasped firmly in her hand. Her arm was extended, holding the weapon out in front of her, the twin blades horizontal to the floor. It was a defensive posture, one meant to guard against a sudden attack from an armed opponent. And in that moment, Bane realized Xana didn't know that he hadn't found his lightsaber yet. I have lived by the principles of the Rule of Two ever since I created it, Bane replied. Everything I have done has been in accordance with its teachings. Xana shook her head. I know you went to Prakith. I know you went after Enderu's holocron. I know you are searching for the secret to eternal life. No. I did that out of necessity. I taught you everything I knew about the dark side. I waited years for you to challenge me. You were content to toil in my shadow, to remain an apprentice, until the ravages of age robbed me of my power. You are unworthy of becoming the master, Xana. That was why I went to Prakith. Bane let his right hand drop to his hip, feigning as if he was preparing to draw his lightsaber. Xana's eyes flickered, drawn by the subtle motion. He kept his hand open, his massive palm completely covering the place where she would normally be able to see the hilt of his lightsaber clipped to his belt. With his mind, he tried to project an image of his hook-handled weapon resting just beneath his empty fingers. Xana stood motionless, staying in her defensive stance, her brow furrowing as she weighed her chances. Then, she threw her head back and laughed as she realized the truth. You are weak, Bane. Weak enough to be caught without your lightsaber. She lunged forward, and Bane slipped to the side, sending cascades of purple lightning crackling towards her. When she recovered and struck again, he did the same, this time soaring high above her, and sending bolts of lightning flying down. As this exchange repeated itself, Xana grew more and more frustrated, unable to down the weaponless opponent that stood before her. But she knew Bane was running out of time. For all his strength and cunning, her master was not perfect. And it was only a matter of time before he made a fatal mistake. Then she heard the telltale alarms of the stone prison begin to blare. Long ago, the prison had been used as a place for political rivals and enemies of the royal family to quietly disappear. The barbaric practice had since been discontinued, but many of the prison's major capabilities were still intact. Chief among them was its ability to self-destruct. Now that the process had begun, Xana and Bane, apprentice and master both, had only moments to escape before the entire prison fell onto them. Xana broke off from Bane, and ran into a corridor that she knew led to a concealed ship. Bane, on the other hand, broke into a run, trusting in the force to guide him to the prison's hangar. He arrived just in time to see a shuttle, with the royal crest rising up and flying away. For an instant, he thought the princess might be on board. Yet when he reached out, he felt a very different presence piloting the craft. Someone with a powerful connection to the dark side. Bane couldn't allow his attention to be drawn by the mysterious individual escaping in the shuttle, however. He had a far more pressing problem. From his vantage point atop the balcony, he could clearly see the Iktachi, who had led the ambush against him back at his mansion. She was dressed in the same black cloak, and she was standing beside a red and black shuttle. She had been looking at the escaping vehicle, but as it sped away, she turned to face Bane. Seeing him, an expression of satisfaction flickered across her features. His feet were already moving towards his foe when the Iktachi dropped to one knee and bowed her head. Holding her hands out palms up as she presented him with his lightsaber as well as his missing holocron. In his studies, Bane had read that the Iktachi possessed a rare form of precognition, where according to context and chance, their visions could show them glimpses of the future, both what could be and for the Iktachi him or herself, what should. This particular Iktachi had seen her destiny to be at Bane's side, learning the ways of the Sith. She was powerful, and already attuned to many of the intricacies that lied in the dark side. 
and who was Bane to deny one as obviously talented and willing from achieving her wishes? A minute later, they were aboard the Itachi shuttle, leaving the stone prison and the final, violent throes of its destruction behind them. The Iktachi told her her name was the Huntress, and that she'd spent the past five years as a freelance assassin. Bane knew more so than anyone of the importance of names. They could define one's future, and drive them to either success or failure. He told the Huntress then that by choosing a new name, she would be reborn in the ways of the dark side. And that name would serve from now until the day she died as the symbol of her new and greater existence. She had chosen then, a single word that reverberated with her own unique power and cunning. Cogniz. Darth Cogniz of the Sith. Cogniz eagerly accepted the teachings of the Rule of Two, and agreed not to intervene in her new master's final duel with Xana. She understood that for the Sith to thrive, one of them would have to die. Bane's message to his former apprentice had been simple. An invitation, and a challenge. Ambria, the healer's camp. Although Xana first thought that Bane was setting a trap for her, his words at the stone prison and his dedication to the Order eventually convinced her of otherwise. In its current state, the Order of the Sith was fractured. They were no longer master and apprentice, but competing rivals for the mantle of Sith Lord. As long as one of them lived, the Sith would be divided. This had to change. When Xana landed on Ambria, she noticed two freshly dug graves by the healer's hut. Sarah and her bodyguard, she thought. Then she saw Bane, and she spoke with quiet confidence. I have surpassed you, master. Then prove it. Xana had expected Bane to begin aggressively, but in no circumstance was she ready for the savage barrage of blows that rained upon her now. He was faster than she could have ever imagined, and he was using new sequences and unfamiliar moves he had never revealed during their practice sessions. Nevertheless, her defense held, and Bane was forced into a pattern of feints and quick thrusts, probing her otherwise impenetrable defense in search of a weakness. She was being driven back in a slow retreat, and she realized he was herding her towards the shuttles, hoping to pin her against the metal hull with no place to go. For now, Xana was content to play along, taking quick, careful steps backward over the soft, sandy terrain as she began to gather her power. The key was subtlety. She couldn't let Bane sense what she was doing, or he would launch into another wild flurry of attacks, forcing her to focus all her energy on keeping him at bay. She had to give him the illusion that he was controlling the action, when in fact she was only a few seconds away from unleashing a burst of dark side sorcery that would rip his mind apart. With her attention split between the enemy in front of her and the Sith spell she was preparing to cast, Xana didn't notice how close she was to the freshly dug graves. Her heel caught, throwing her off balance as she fell awkwardly onto the ground. Bane was on her in an instant, and she felt a sharp crack as the toe of his boot caught her in the ribs, yet she managed to avoid the next strike and get back onto her feet. Gritting her teeth, Xana reached out and touched the mind of her master. Bane let out a scream and dropped to his knees. Bane knew the apparitions he saw were a trick. The beasts weren't real. They were just figments of his imagination, born from the repressed memories of his childhood. His greatest fears manifested in physical form. Yet he had conquered these fears long ago. He had turned his fear of his abusive father into anger and hate. The tools that had given him the strength to endure and eventually escape his life on Apatros. He knew how to defeat these demons, and so he struck back. Unleashing a primal scream, he channeled his terror into pure rage and lashed out at the dark side. It tore through the Force Swarm in a burst of searing violet light, utterly obliterating them. Xana watched as Bane struggled, then overcame the Sith spell she had unleashed upon him. Again, she opened herself to the dark side. 
This time, however, she didn't attack Bane directly. Instead, she let the force flow through her, drawing it from the soil and stone of Ambria itself. She called to power buried for centuries, summoning it up to the surface in wispy tendrils of dark smoke snaking up from the sand. The thin tendrils crawled along the ground, reaching for one another, entwining onto itself into writhing tentacles each several meters long. Then, in response to her unspoken command, the tentacles rose up and lashed out towards our foe. As the tendrils touched Bane's shoulder, the material of his clothes melted away as if it had been splashed with acid. The flesh beneath simply dissolved. Bane screamed in agony. Orbalisks had once fused with the skin with a burning chemical compound so intense it had nearly driven him mad. He had also been nearly cooked alive by his own lightning at the Battle of Tython. Sarah had also pumped him full of a drug that felt like it was eating him alive from the inside. But the excruciating pain he felt from a mere touch of the dark side tendril was unlike anything Bane had ever experienced before. Even still, Bane gathered his focus and struck at Xana. And focused on the spell, she was taken by surprise and knocked to the ground. With his foe unarmed and helpless, Bane raised his lightsaber for the killing strike, only to have it intercepted mid-swing by one of the dark side tendrils. His arm fell, disembodied to the ground, and the Dark Lord collapsed. Bane's vision went black, and he felt the void closing in. In desperation, and in a last act of defiance, he summoned all his remaining power and invoked the ritual of essence transfer. Bane was suddenly fully aware of his physical surroundings. He could see with Xana's eyes, he could hear with her ears, he could feel the intense heat of the ritual's crimson glow through her skin. But Xana was still there too. He could feel her terror and confusion as if they were his own, and when she screamed in horror, he screamed with her. The black tendrils vanished as her concentration was shattered, disappearing like smoke on the wind. Instinctively, she fought to repel the invader. Bane could feel her pushing him away, rejecting him, trying to drive him out even as he tried to force his way in and snuff out her existence. It became a battle of wills, their two identities locked together inside Xana's mind, grappling for possession of her body. And so they teetered on the precipice of the void, Bane seeking to obliterate all trace of her identity while she sought to cast him down into the blackness. For a moment, they seemed evenly matched, neither gaining nor giving ground. Then suddenly, in a blast of light, it was over. From a safe distance, Cognus watched the two figures wage battle. She was an impartial observer, having no preference as to which one would emerge victorious. She only wanted to serve whoever proved the stronger. She had seen Bane knock the woman to the ground and raise his lightsaber, only to have his arm hewn off by one of the black tendrils. Then there had been a flash of light so bright, she had been forced to close her eyes and look away. When she looked back, Bane was gone, and Xana lay still on the ground, dazed but alive. Even from a distance, she had sensed an incredible burst of power, the same power she had sensed in Bane himself. She didn't know how it was possible, but it almost seemed as if the Dark Lord's life energy had suddenly burst forth from his body in one glorious instant, releasing itself upon the material world. Then, as suddenly as she had sensed the presence, it was gone, vanishing like an animal gone to ground. As ludicrous as it might seem, there was only one place she could imagine it to have gone. As the woman on the ground shifted, Cognus hesitated before asking, Lord Bane, is that you? Bane is gone, the woman replied, her voice confident and strong. I am Darth Xana, Dark Lord of the Sith, and your new master. Thank you everyone for watching. If you've made it until now, that's completely insane because this was a long video. I've been making Star Wars YouTube videos for almost five or six years now, and 
going back to one of my favorite video series, the Bane series, and remastering it and re-editing and re-recording everything has been just a moment for me to touch base and realize how much I love Star Wars. Because there's so much here, even in a story about the Sith, someone so brutal and cunning and devastatingly effective as Bane, that relates so much to us. That, I feel like, is why I love Star Wars. Because despite its epic nature, despite the grand battles and the galaxy-killing weapons and the prophecies, the true power of the series lies within the characters, within the individuals. Let me know what you think, and if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to subscribe and like and comment what you think about it. I'll see you guys all next time, and as always, may the Force be with you.